Hello and welcome to another edition of In Theo Radio, where we talk about shamanism, psychedelics, and altered states for healing. This is your host, Captain Hugh T. Alchemy, also known as Trevar. I'm very, very happy to d- today to welcome a very special and important guest, um, Dr. Rick Strassman. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Trevor, for having me. Um, and here's Rick's bio. Uh, Rick Strassman is a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine and president and co-founder of the Cottonwood Research Foundation. From 1990 to 1995, he performed the first new human studies with psychedelic drugs in the United States in more than 20 years, focusing on the powerful naturally occurring compound DMT or dimethyltryptamine. He is the author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and the co-author of Inner Space, Inner Paths to Outer Space. He lives in Gallup, New Mexico. You still in Gallup? I still am in Gallup, uh, where it's wet and soggy everywhere. Good. Uh, It's wet here in San Diego, too. Uh, Do you guys get any snow up there? Uh, We get a lot of snow. it gets cold here. It's pretty close to the Continental Divide at around 7,000 feet. Okay, you're right. So we've already had a low one morning of one above Fahrenheit. Wow. <laughs> That's a little low for me. I'm happy to be in San Diego. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I did my fellowship at UC San Diego. Oh, did you? La Jolla VA. I lived in the Pacific Beach for a year. And uh, I just loved it there. It's it's a whole nother realm, and yeah, PB uh, that coastal little coastal town. Yeah, it's it's pretty well known if you're in California, if you're going up and down the coast, and yeah, everyone gets to live in in the coastal town, San Diego, once in a while, and it's it's a vibe for sure. So, uh, well, you know, one of my mentors at UCSD uh, characterized. San Diego in a really succinct manner. He said, uh, everyone's beautiful in San Diego. That's a, that's a good way of, of thinking about it. I, I have often sparred with people about that because I've lived in Las Vegas and, and Las Vegas tries, but San Diego, everyone's pretty, pretty active. They're all beach bodies. They're all outdoors and it's all good weather all, all year round, pretty much. Um, well, you know, I learned how to do clinical psychopharmacology at UC San Diego, you know, okay. giving experimental drugs in a, in a scientific setting, um, collecting samples, giving rating scales, analyzing data. Uh, yeah, so that was a formative year and uh, helped me uh, formulate and perform uh, the clinical research that I did with both melatonin and with DMT later. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So when you talk about your work, did you start up, uh, did you start off uh, with lab rats and, and animals and then work your way up to humans or were there always human volunteers for these uh, hallucinogenic tryptamines? Well, in college, I did some lab research with chicken embryos. Uh, but that gave me bad dreams. Uh, and uh, I didn't like being cloistered in a lab like that. Uh, so I quickly decided in my early 20s, I wanted to do human work or human research. Uh, so that was pretty much it with the melatonin work and the psychedelic work uh, was normal volunteers. We never studied patients, people with depression or okay. uh, PTSD, those kinds of things. It was just normal volunteers. Yeah, and your study took place so early on. I mean, I started hearing about psychedelic research in maybe 20, 2008, 2009, and your study like predates that a long time. Yeah, we gave our first dose of DMT in late 1990, and we wrapped up in September 95. Uh, so it wasn't um, until quite a few years that... Uh, the field got some traction and some greater visibility, maybe 10 years. 
That's amazing. And, and how did people feel about you doing that work when you told them about doing that work in the early nineties? <laughs> um, well, you know, it was a complicated time. I mean, that was the era of the first George Bush. Mm -hmm. Um, the war on drugs was pretty hot and heavy. Uh, but, um, I had established my credentials as a clinical researcher uh, at UNM in Albuquerque. And uh, when the melatonin study didn't turn out to establish melatonin as especially psychoactive, uh, I decided to study DMT instead. And um, when I you know, told the people in the department and the research uh, center that I wanted to change fields and go into psychedelic you know, drug research uh, they you know it, it was you know it it was um, you know so far off the radar uh, I, I mean people had basically forgotten about psychedelic drugs uh, one of the administrators for uh, the research unit uh, an endocrinologist used to joke about us smoking mushrooms back there. You know, so that was you know, the level of sophistication that was you know, circulating at the time about uh, you know, psychedelic drugs. You know, so they you know, basically said, if that's what you want to do, you've got uh, a track record that you've established, you've published, you've gotten grants, you've been to meetings. You know, so if this is what you want to do, uh, you know, do it. Be, be careful. Stay out of the newspaper, uh, and uh, and um, we'll support you. Um, you know, so locally uh, at uh, the university and the New Mexico setting, it uh, was pretty supported. Um, you know, the government in Washington, DEA and FDA. Uh, presented some more obstacles from a you know, regulatory point of view. Uh, you know, my colleagues or my you know, scientific colleagues, like the ones I might you know go to meetings uh, with, were uh, well. It would, um, it would you know depend on the generation. Um, you know, some of the older researchers that had cut their teeth on human psychedelic you know, drug research in uh, the '60s would you know, come up to my DMT you know, poster and say, oh, we thought that was like way in history. Uh, or they'd say, is deja vu all over again? Or, um, you know, weren't those you know, theories debunked? You know, so the older generation was skeptical or bemused. Uh, you know, the younger you know, generation of you know, researchers uh, were both curious and a little afraid, like uh, they didn't know much about you know, psychedelics, but they knew that psychiatry research had gotten a black eye over their study uh, you know, previously. You know, so they were you know, kind of you know, tentatively interested, like, uh, oh, wow, you know, this is interesting, but uh, it's going to ruin your career, isn't it? Uh, so. Um, yeah, it was a you know, very you know, uh, complicated set of cultural and you know, political, historical streams in you know, the kind of meeting uh, at that time. Interesting. And give me a common thing that they would say. Maybe you would pass somebody in the hall and, and you know, maybe you'd even start a conversation with a new person and you start off with the topic of this is what I'm doing. Uh, what, what was one of the most common turn of phrases they would use? <laughs> um, I never told people what I was doing. I really kept it uh, to myself. Um, you know, when when uh, you know, people you know would ask me what I do, I would say I work at the University of New Mexico, and I would you know try to you know change the topic, and you know, then. Uh, you know, they'd say, well, you know, what do you do there? And I'd say, well, um, I'm a you know, psychiatrist and I work in the department there. And, uh, you know, they might say, well, you know, what do you do there? And I'd say, I teach, do research and see patients. You know, so I would make it extremely difficult for to kind of, uh, you know, jump right into it. Uh, 
you know, but at the same time, I was recruiting volunteers. Uh, so depending on who the person was and their you know, level of sophistication with you know, drugs, you know, psychedelics, uh, I would, you know, uh, well, I would immediately uh, start talking about the study and uh, whether they might be interested in participating. How interesting. So I'm going to ask you some real off-cuff questions, and you can bypass them and you will not offend me. <laughs> so why, why dimethyltryptamine, why intravenous DMT versus um, mescaline, LSD, or psilocybin? Why that one? Uh, well, at least a couple of reasons. Um, one was that it was obscure. It, it was relatively obscure. And uh, I knew if the media found out about our work, uh, that there would be you know, less of a stir if uh, we weren't studying LSD, which you know, attained a pretty nefarious reputation uh, within scientific you know, public and you know, political circles. Um, yeah, you know, so it, it was obscure. You know, Terence McKenna had just started his uh, uh, discussions of DMT, uh, but it was still, you know, rather early. I don't think many of our volunteers even knew about Terence at the time. Um, it, it was, you know, short acting. Uh, when it smoked, it uh, begins working uh, within a heartbeat or two, peaks in two or three minutes, and people are down uh, by half hour, you know, 40 minutes or so. You know, so I knew the studies would have to take place in a really clinical environment. We uh, you know, wanted to uh, frame the work in as conservative and uh, meat and you know, potatoes clinical research you yeah. know, uh, you know, context as possible. You know, so the study would occur on a research unit with cancer patients getting experimental chemotherapy, you know, diabetes research where people were going into hypoglycemia. You know, so it, it was going to be a harsh environment or, you know, potentially. And I thought if people had bad trips because of the environment, they'd be short-lived as opposed to six hours, eight hours, you know, 10 right. hours, even 12 with mescaline. Yeah. Um, and from the you know, scientific point of view, uh, you know, there were um, a lot of interesting unanswered questions about you know, DMT. It's endogenous. It's made in the uh, human body. Um, and one wonders, you know, what it's doing there. Um, it's also an abused drug and could be you know, seen as the model or the you know, simplest of the tryptamine compounds. And uh, you know, the more we understood about you know, DMT, we could uh, extrapolate you know, to other drugs like you know, psilocybin or LSD, which are tryptamine-like. Yes. Um, you know, so there were you know, drug abuse questions, you know, psychosis questions because of endogenous DMT. Is it uh, being overproduced in schizophrenics, let's say, uh, and you know, clinical, uh, you know, clinical reasons. Uh, it was you know, short-lived, and uh, you know, political ones. It's uh, a relative lack of notoriety. Yeah, that's that's a really great and uh, I'm well thought through answer. And <laughs> it seems like seems like that might even have been in your first book. Yeah, that's in the first first book. The yeah, uh, uh, so that's in the spirit molecule, DMT, the spirit molecule. Um, and it was also in, you know, my grant applications uh, mm -hmm. because I, I um, you know, needed to be uh, as upfront as I could be about what the risks were, uh, what the important questions were. Um, you know, even though I had ulterior, you know, theological questions, uh, it was a straight ahead psychopharmacology study, you know, funded by the war on drugs. Uh, you know, and uh, being very, you know, closely watched by FDA and the DEA. It was the first one of its kind in you know, so long. So um, yeah, I really, uh, it was you know, really important to uh, 
be extraordinarily straightforward and honest and, uh, you know, uh, intelligent about it. Beautiful. I think you play that part very well. And you are definitely one of the most prestigious and well-known people that have been on in Theo Radio. Um, so when did that book come out? The notoriety came much later, right? The first book in your series was closer to 2000? Yeah, it came out, um, I think January 2001. Okay. Uh, so it's been out on, or, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it, it was January 2001. I was in Taos at the time. Um, yeah, it's uh, done quite well, that book. 193,000 copies have sold. It's been translated into 13 or 14 languages. Oh. Um, you know, plus it's, you know, the basis of the, you know, documentary by the same name, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Yes. Uh, which has been incredibly successful and well received. Yeah, the documentary really did popularize the subject and the, and the substance, the, the molecule itself. I, I think, I would say the ball has been moved forward by your work and your authorship, um, maybe more so than Terrence McKenna. Well, I think from the point of view of, you know, research, especially clinical or human research, yeah, uh, our work at UNM clearly established it could be done and how to do it. Beautiful, beautiful. So what was it like for you to bring your, and then the movie came out, what, close 2012, 10 years after the book? First. Oh, man. Uh, I think either 2000. Uh, I think 2011 or 2012, we, we began to film in January 2007 wow. uh, in Albuquerque, our first uh, you know, set of interviews. Um, and then in you know, Berkeley, a few months later in 2007, then New York in 2008, and you know, then there was a you know, dry spell with respect to funding. And uh, we didn't pick up again for another year or two and you know, finished our interviews in uh, New York again. Yeah, so I think it came out, I think we finished interviewing in 2009. And uh, I think it came out two years later. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, that, I've, I've probably watched that movie twice and I've told dozens of people about it. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, well, you know, I've watched that film 13 times, and uh, nice. it's, uh, it's really jam-packed, you know, full of information and ideas and, uh, uh, you know, concepts. Uh, yeah, and it's really great, you know, visual imagery. Uh, you know, but I always pick up at least one new thing with every viewing, even after watching it 13 times. Well, were you able to see the most recent showings of Fantastic Fungi in the theaters? I know that's a, a recent film where they talk about psy psilocybin pretty openly. Uh, no, no, I, I haven't seen it. It's playing in Albuquerque, um, I think, this week I, at the Guild Theater. You know, so if you're in the Southwest, New Mexico, you know, go see Fantastic Fungi at the Guild Theater. I think it's the 11th and 13th, perhaps. Yeah, but it is th this week, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, one of my favorite, most recent documentaries to have come out. And uh, I had the privilege of sitting, oh, 10 feet away from Paul Stamets and then interacting with him uh, with a microphone, uh, asking questions. So it was pretty cool. It came to town in San Diego three weeks ago, about three weeks ago. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Paul... Yeah, Paul Stamis deserves a Nobel Prize. <laughs> He's definitely up there with, amongst the people that have moved ecology and plant medicines forward and, and our, um, our human potential movement. Uh, he's what is, they call that a, uh, not a bioengineer, maybe it's a bioneer. Yeah, the bioneer kind of thing. A bioneer, yeah. So this is the most recent copy. For those who can see the video, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. This is the uh, most recent edition of the DMT series, Rick, right? 
Uh, well, I've never, you know, considered it a series, but, you know, that's an interesting idea uh, because each of them, uh, 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 well, you know, because each of them, you know, deals you know, with DMT uh, and uh, it's an evolving story for sure. Um, but still, uh, I think, or I've, uh, you know, up, up until now, I've, uh, you know, thought of the prophetic states you know, book as a you know, standalone item. Uh, I review the DMT work in the first quarter, first twenty percent of the prophetic states book, uh, but you know, then move on to a, a top-down model of the prophetic experience, which involves DMT. Right, and you're talking about this book, right? When you say prophetic states, the soul of prophecy. Yeah, yeah, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. You know, the title's interesting. I just wanted to call it the Soul of Prophecy uh, because even though, you know, DMT plays a role, I believe, in the prophetic state, the, the you know, Soul of Prophecy, you know, the information, it's, it's fundamental and essential uh, characteristics. You know, don't have anything to do with drugs. They're more or even the brain in a way. It's, uh, you know, the information that's contained uh, in the text uh, is the, you know, soul of prophetic experience. You know, but, you know, my publisher, uh, you know, who's got the you know, final say when it comes to the title of any book, you know, said, uh, you know, DMT sells. So DMT is going to be in the title if you, yeah. you know, if you like it or not. Uh, you know, so it's been a mixed bag. I mean, I, you know, people, you know, it's true, you know, DMT sells. Uh, you know, but at the same time, I've always wanted to kind of extend my reach beyond the you know, solely psychedelic community into those who might uh, be interested in you know, prophecy and the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, uh, and you know that's occurring. It's uh, you know like a slow, it's a slow process. You know that you know book is the end result of eighteen years of work, um, and in you know, some ways I'm more proud of it than the original DMT book, the Spirit Molecule, uh, because I had to learn a whole new discipline uh, and a way of you know thinking ab about reality, uh, as opposed to the first DMT book, which in a way, is a collection of you know, bedside notes with a uh, you know, preface and an afterword. Uh, you know, but this book about you know, prophecy uh, required you know, learning the Hebrew Bible to the best of my ability. So but, you know, that was a pretty big you know, challenge you know, for an older guy, even in my 40s. Well, they say, what well, you have to be over 30-something to study uh, Kabbalah, right? Or you'll go and um, that's, <laughs> yeah. Well, you need to be married, and you need to be at least you know forty years old. Okay. Yeah. Married and forty. Yeah. Maybe I maybe I studied Kabbalah a little too young, and then that's why I'm <laughs> a little bit a little bit weird. Well, you know, what do you make of the requirement to be married? Um. I think that basically means monogamy. I think that means as I mean, well, I, you can, you can give me more detail and I'm, I'm open to being uh, reinterpreted, reinterpretive. Um, but I, I feel, I feel it has to do with uh, learning to deepen into love and relationship with one person and learning to see that person more clearly the way that they talk about in the tantric and ascetic uh, forms of yoga, the baby, I mean, what do you think? Well, yeah, um, I think those are true reasons. Um, I think that's right. I, I think at a more you know, practical, everyday you know, level, uh, if you're married, your spouse keeps on knocking you off the pedestal if you know she's worth her weight uh or you know worth her salt uh you know take out the garbage you know why do you think you're so smart or you know why do you think you, um you're so privileged you know they 
keep you from overweening pride, which I think is one of the dangers of exalted states of consciousness of any sort with, with you know, drugs or you know, those um, occurring within the you know, setting of on a religious um, community or a you know, religious tradition. Absolutely. I, I actually, I agree with you there and I'm, I'm sad that I overlooked that, but yeah, the daily practice of, um, relationship and humbleness. Yes, absolutely. Uh, have you, I, I mean, I'm not sure if this is on topic or if it's too personal. Have you practiced gematria in the middle of the night? Like it's recommended sometimes, or, you know, the, the, the doing of, uh, resuscitation of words and the spellings of words from, the Hebrew traditions. No, no. To be honest, I've avoided Kabbalah, both the study and the practice. Uh, it just seems a bit too complicated. Um, and uh, you know, the practices, uh, you know, they are a bit on the you know, magical side. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a little cautious about you know, magical you know, practice, you know, not because it isn't effective or it doesn't work, you know, but because it does, um, you know, so you really have to, you know, know what you're doing and why and what your intent is, you know, so I've just, you know, focused on the text, you know, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Torah, the prophets and the writings. Um, yeah, you know, so I study the Hebrew Bible every day. There's, uh, and, you know, there's a huge number of, you know, commentators who, uh, you know, began writing commentaries on the text, uh, you know, thousands of years ago at around the time of the compilation of the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, tradition of writing commentaries, you know, continues. Um, you know, so I'm, you know, reading the Torah once a year, the whole thing, and, uh, I try to have a new commentary open uh, you know, that year. Um, yeah, you know, so you know, there's been a lot written about the Hebrew Bible. I could, you know, show you my bookshelves, uh, which is about you know two thirds. Oh of wow, that's, what I've got. that's a library. That's a study right there. Yeah, and that's all the Hebrew Bible. It's all you know things you know that are written about or you know because of you know, the Hebrew Bible. Wow. Yeah. So um, in a recent interview with Graham Hancock, you, you discussed how you started um, maybe not as faithful in the Jewish tradition. Uh, well, you started with it uh, as, as you were up, brought, brought up, and then you moved away from it and moved towards Zen Buddhism for a while. Is that right? Am I getting the timeline correct on that? Yeah. Um, I was you know, born and raised in a conservative you know, Jewish community and household you know, family. Yeah, I was you know, bar mitzvahed when I was you know, 13. Um, you know, we never really you know, touched upon spiritual issues to any extent hmm. in the you know, six hours per week uh, you know, Hebrew school that was you know, supplemental you know, to my public school education, okay. which uh, I did from you know, you know, five years old. Um, until I was 13. You know, we learned some Hebrew, we learned some Bible, you know, we learned about Israel, uh, you know, the festivals, uh, um, you know, folk dancing. I was a member of the, you know, folk dancing squad. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was ecstatic, but we never, you know, talked about the ecstasy as kids. I mean, it was fun and uh, it was, you know, great to perform. Uh, you know, but the spinning and the clapping and the, you know, keeping, you know, time uh, with a, a big group of people with, you know, the audience screaming, uh, yeah, it's an altered state, you know, but we never, you know, obviously discussed, you know, the altered state that all of us were in. Um, yeah, you know, so I had to, you know, look elsewhere for, you know, satisfying my curiosity in altered states and, uh, that you know, began with you know, transcendental meditation, uh, and then I you know, learned about you know, Buddhism, and then uh, st uh, started a more earnest you know, practice and study in my early twenties. And uh, you know that kind of wrapped up, or at least my relationship with the larger monastic or uh, 
yeah, you know, the larger monastic community uh, kind of you know, wound down maybe 23 years ago or so. Okay. You know, but I was in it you know, pretty deep for over 20 years. I was you know, married at the monastery and uh, uh, you know, co-founded and, and you know, helped you know, lead an affiliated you know, meditation group for years and years. You know, so, um, you know, it was, uh, um, it was the uh, spiritual practice and community uh, which I you know, relied upon. You know, so, you know, once the you know, formal, uh, you know, relationship with that community, uh, uh, you know, wrapped up, um, I was free to begin, you know, looking at uh, the you know, Jewish, um, you know, tradition. Uh, and I was also interested in, in Judaism because uh, I had an inkling that its form of spiritual understanding was more relevant to the DMT effect. Uh, you know, the Buddhist model uh, characterized the visions and the voices as, you know, by and large, um, you know, kind of delusional in a way or you know, superficial. You know, they were, you know, not what you were looking for. Uh, you know, they were um, essentially unreal, the phenomena. And you know, one of you know, the hallmarks of the you know, DMT effect is its convincingly real quality. People come back saying it feels more real than real. Um, you know, so the, um, the you know, Zen Buddhist approach you know, to the altered state brought on by you know, DMT didn't quite you know, valence you know, the reality quality to the extent that you know, seemed to be the case in the minds of the volunteers. Um, in addition, uh, the uh, peak effect of DMT was quite you know, full of content, uh, quite interactive, quite relational. Um, and uh, I was expecting uh, from my study of, of uh, you know, Zen Buddhism, you know, that the peak effect of the DMT state would be a you know, formless, content-free, ego-dissolving kind of an effect. Um, and you know, that you know, wasn't what the DMT volunteers described, uh, in which case they, <clears throat> You know, maintain their you know, sense of self and identity. You know, they could interact with things voluntarily. Um, it was quite emotional, either positive or negative. Uh, you know, so that you know wasn't consistent with the you know, Zen Kensho uh, you know, prototype. Uh, yeah, you know, so I began studying the Hebrew Bible as the you know, basis of you know, Jewish belief, and. Uh, the you know notion of a you know, prophetic state with a overlapping phenomenology with you know the DMT experience uh, began to take shape. That's beautiful. And so, what gave you? So, other than your upbringing, was there some other intuitive push towards um, studying the Hebrew Bible to determine uh, to seek these uh, endogenous and or uh, Exogenous altered states um, in the in the scriptures. Um, well, you know there were um, a couple of things about the you know, DMT reports that uh, I couldn't quite work through while I was doing this study, and I needed a lot of time to think about it afterwards. Hmm. Um, one of the features was the reality you know, basis or you know, the reality you know, sensation, uh, which we just talked about. Yeah. And um, the other um, is what uh, you know, seemed to be the inhabited uh, uh, quality of the DMT space. It you know, seemed to be inhabited um, by some intelligence. Um, it could be, you know, discerned as, you know, discrete objects, you know, the so-called beings mm -hmm. uh, who are intelligent and they're powerful and they interact with you in this world of light that's, you know, the DMT world. Um, or else the intelligence or the, you know, sentience was, 
you know, more, you know, diffused in the space uh, itself. Uh, you know, the colors, let's say, uh, the you know, pulsating experience. Um, but still, it, it you know, felt inhabited. You know, so even though um, I expected it in a way, it still, you know, surprised me uh, with how frequent it was, how compelling it was, how utterly um, strange it was. Uh, so, you know, those were the, uh, you know, two most, you know, puzzling features of you know, the DMT experience. You know, so I just, you know, wasn't happy with any of the models for those two attributes that uh, I had previously you know, brought to bear on the work. The you know, psychopharmacology model seemed kind of, you know, soulless in a way. You know, this is your brain on drugs. Yeah. You know, which is true. I mean, obviously, it's your brain, it's on drugs, but, uh, you mm-hmm. know, what is really going on? Uh, you know, so, you know, like, you know, why is the brain configured that way that when you give this drug, it happens to cause these experiences? You know, what's the value there? You know, you know, why is it, uh, you know, designed that way? Um, you know, so I also, you know, brought to bear the you know, psychoanalytic perspective, you know, like all the visions and you know, the voices were you know, symbolic of, you know, something else. Uh, you know, they represented unconscious impulses or drives or conflicts. Um, I mean, even repressed, you know, memories uh, still, you know, they were residing uh, in the mind and they, well, no, that, that, you know, that's a bit off track. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, I'll just, you know, leave it, you know, uh, with regard to the unconscious, you know, drives and, you know, conflicts. Okay. Um, you know, I started to, you know, look at, um, you know, quantum physics, uh, parallel universes, uh, you know, dark you know, matter. You know, perhaps, you, you know, DMT uh, modified the receiving characteristics of the mind-brain complex and allowed you to see, you know, levels of the you know, physical, you know, world which are normally invisible, like a you know, telescope or a spectrometer or a microscope. Mm-hmm. You know, but even so, uh, you know, even if that were true, which is a far, uh, you know, which is a huge leap, uh, it's it still really didn't address the more, you know, fundamental question, you know, why are things designed that way? You know, if, if you know, DMT, you know, provides access to usually invisible layers of the physical universe, you know, why? Uh, you know, what is the... You know, value or the you know the meaning you know, behind that configuration that you know mechanism of action mm-hmm. you know so I started to look you know for more you know theological you know religious uh, streams of you know, thought which address altered states but also uh, have worked uh, more consistently over a longer period of time to extract uh, you know information from those states uh you know the you know specific ideas specific guidelines you know for behavior um you know so i had pretty much maxed out on the zen model uh for the reasons we already spoke about uh you know shamanism i don't i just don't know that much about and uh it you know seemed as if you know there were a lot of moral and ethical you know, baggage problems with, you know, shamanism. It's a lot of black magic and sure. spiritual, you know, warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it seemed kind of dark. And uh, I was starting to think, well, you know, I'm a Westerner. I, you know, write to, you know, mostly a uh, you know, Western audience. Uh, and uh, isn't there, uh, you know, Western, uh, you know, tradition? Uh, and obviously being raised, you know, Jewish and having some familiarity with the Hebrew Bible, you know, that was a you know, natural uh, you know, place to you know, begin, you know, looking, you know, for, you know, number one, I'm a Western model. And, you know, number two, you know, one that was more compatible with the descriptions, uh, you know, from the DMT volunteers. Absolutely. Hmm. So... I'm going to, I'm going to ask you kind of anatomy physiology question, and then I'm going to, I'm going to segue into the, the brain chemistry and possibly the anatomy of those people that lived long ago in the time of the Hebrew Bible. 
And so I was curious if you could tell me a little bit about uh, the the places in the body that endogenous DMT is produced and um, where we're digesting that, where it's it's being uptaken to our system um, as a as you know, it's something I'm, I'm sure this is a very basic question. Um, I think, well, for some people listening, maybe this is their first exposure to D DMT. And uh, I think I've heard within my community, a lot of argument about whether it's coming from the pineal gland in the head or it's coming from the lungs through breathing and, and exercising of um, trans transformational breathing exercises, pranayams, that, that sort of thing. Um, well, you know, first, uh, you know, we can state that there are you know, hundreds of plants, if not you know, thousands, which contain you know, DMT, uh, sponges, fish, maybe. Uh, so it's pretty widespread uh, th uh, in the natural world. Um, well, so DMT, 5-methoxy-DMT, and bufotenine were discovered in uh, mammalian tissues in the rabbit and the rat. I think you know, mostly the rabbit in uh, you know the early 1960s. Uh, and then those compounds were discovered in human tissues, uh, blood, urine, and spinal fluid. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so you know people have wondered, you know, where is that DMT made? Um, you know, for a number of years, maybe just until the, the last you know, 10 years or so, 15 years, um, the uh, standard or the, uh, you know, widespread belief was that the lungs made you know, DMT. Uh, the concentration of the enzymes responsible for DMT synthesis are quite high in the lungs. Uh, you know, levels of you know, DMT were determined to be high in the lungs. Hmm. But um, the you know, data, the more you know, recent genetic data, uh, genes, DNA, enzymes, uh, are all you know, pointing you know, towards the brain area, you know, the brain itself. Um, in my DMT book, The Spirit Molecule, I you know, bring uh, to examine um, a lot of uh, older studies which you know, pointed to the possibility of the pineal gland making DMT. And because of you know, the religious you know, significance of the pineal gland throughout history, uh, it would be an amazing coincidence if there were some you know, biological correlate of the experience of an inner light uh, in the middle of the head resulting from prayer or from meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and a group in Ann Arbor, Gimo Borgigian, uh, at, in, their, in uh, you know, their neuroscience department, uh, published a paper in 2013 which uh, reported uh, you know, measurable levels of DMT in the living rodent pineal gland. Uh, so you know that was a you know confirmatory finding. You know that uh, indeed there was DMT in the pineal. Yeah. Uh, but the you know same group in Ann Arbor has continued you know looking at you know uh, you know DMT in the brain, the pineal gland, and uh, the same lab. Uh, the you know, same laboratory published a paper a few months back, which uh, you know, demonstrated you know, DMT synthesis in the rodent brain. Uh, and the uh, you know, previous study, which uh, you know, suggested DMT was in the pineal, uh, were, was a spurious you know, finding uh, resulting from the probe being poked you know, through the brain into the pineal gland in that earlier study, you know, measuring you know, DMT in the uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, the brain tissue, which was collected inadvertently at the same time. Okay. Uh, you know, so at least with this new study, there isn't the evidence that the pineal makes DMT. You know, but what is even more important, I think, uh, you know, way beyond the silver lining, it's you know the you know, silver body, yeah. is uh, you know that the 
concentrations of DMT in the brain are almost as high or are in the same you know, ballpark uh, you know, quantity as um, you know, well-known you know, neurotransmitters like you know, serotonin and like dopamine. Okay. You know, so that begins to get you thinking about a DMT neurotransmitter system uh, in the mammalian brain, which would be a very strange thing. Um, so uh, that's where that group um, is heading to, you know, look at, uh, you know, the you know, DMT mechanism, you know, machinery uh, in the mammal. Interesting. So and then we apply this information that we know maybe uh, a little bit about those studies in modern times on rodents and, and mammals and humans um, to what may have been with the Hebrew people at the time when the stories were being told. And perhaps there was a different biome inside the gut. Maybe they had a different amount of um, oxygen on the planet, or maybe they had certain practices that allowed them to have these myst mystical, I'm going to call them mystical experiences. Um, what do you theorize? Oh, oh, you know, one more thing to, you know, wrap up the endogenous you know, DMT sure. story. Um, yeah, uh, well, so Borgesian's uh, group uh, um, reported that brain levels of DMT increase markedly after cardiac arrest in a rodent. Uh, the concentrations you know, go up by at least a factor of you know, five, I think, or eight times. Uh, you know, significant increase of brain DMT in the dying animal. You know, so that I think uh, is another piece in the puzzle of understanding uh, the biology of the near death state. Yes, yes. Oh, I have so many follow ups to that. So, questions that are tabled. Tell me about, because I, because I really want this, this, um, this interview to be focused on some of these um, stories in 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 the in the Hebrew Bible, and I've had such a great time interfacing with um, scholarly Jewish peoples about your book in the last two three weeks since we've talked and leading up to this interview. So, tell me what you think about the time, the biome, and the microbiome, and and then the you know the food and the the, the set and setting that these people were living in, and maybe that can help us to discover a little bit more about DMT endogenous or exogenous? Yeah, um, well, we don't really know any way to increase endogenous DMT synthesis. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the idea that you could, you know, do you know, something or there was, you know, something in your physical environment uh, that might raise the endogenous levels of DMT, uh, it would be hard to imagine right now anyway. Um, I think as we learn more about what you know, regulates in, uh, uh, you know, levels of endogenous DMT, we could then look you know, backwards at uh, whether those circumstances were existent in ancient times. Um, you know, so those are all what you would consider you know, bottom-up ways of increasing endogenous DMT, you know, theoretically. Um, you know, the you know, top-down model, which is the one I ultimately uh, introduce in the Prophetic States book, is a top-down model wherein, uh, you know, God, in order to communicate with humans, is the one who stimulates endogenous DMT through the uh, outpouring or overflowing or emanation of divine energy, uh, you know, downwards into the human brain. You know, so it's, uh, I guess, as it were, uh, an increase of, you know, DMT from above uh, as, as opposed to from below. They both, you know, theoretically, you know, DMT in the brain is DMT in the brain. Uh, so you know, what it's doing, um, uh, you know, pharmacologically would be indistinguishable between those you know, two cases. Uh, and, you know, that, in a way, is a good springboard to uh, discuss the 
prophetic states book and you know what you know, prompted me to write it um you tell. Well, you know, as we were discussing earlier, I was looking for a better model uh, and um, began thinking about the prophetic state as a model. And, you know, my intuition was um, that the descriptions of the two experiences were quite you know, similar, uh, you know, phenomenologically. Uh, so... Uh, you know, the visions and the voices, uh, the emotions, the body sensations, you know, those are all, all reported in the Hebrew Bible in people experiencing, uh, uh, you know, what I call prophetic consciousness, you know, which is any altered state in the Hebrew Bible. It isn't just foretelling or predicting. It's any spiritual experience, okay. uh, you know, seeing God or angels flying through space and you know, seeing things. If you read, you know, chapter one of Ezekiel, it is a completely, uh, uh, you know, carbon copy of a big DMT trip. Uh, <laughs> he falls down. He hears a, a, you know, roaring waters. Uh, you know, there's a blue, you know, firmament above his head. Uh, he's yanked by the hair, you know, by an angel, uh, you know, taken through space. He's, you know, fearful. He's freaking out. Uh, you know, the visions. Uh, spinning wheels and angels with eyes on their wings. Yes. Yeah, you know, this was all written like a long, long time ago. And there isn't any mention of drugs. Uh, you know, so you have got to think that there was, you know, something going on in his you know, brain, which was mediating, at least, uh, the experiences that he described. Um, you know, so the descriptions of the two states were quite, you know, similar. And I compared the prophetic experiences with you know, those of my DMT volunteers and found an extremely high correspondence. Uh, but uh, still, you know, the DMT state doesn't have the impact on the larger culture, let's say, as uh, the you know, prophetic, uh, you know, the prophetic experiences. You know, everybody knows about Moses and Abraham and Daniel and, uh, you know, David, uh, you know, Jacob and, Abraham and Isaac, uh, you know, they all had, you know, uh, you know prophetic uh, you know, communication with, you know, the divine. Um, so the, you know, content of the message of, of those people who underwent those DMT-like experiences uh, are obviously more rich. You know, the information is more enduring, more impactful. You know, like like if you look at you know Western civilization, which is the you know, dominant civilization, you know, for better or you know for worse, uh, in a, a lot of ways, it's based on you know notions and you know, practices, which were first laid down in the Hebrew Bible. You know, the economy, philosophy, m you know, morality, uh, you know, politics, you know, theology, all of those. Are you know basically uh, you know derivatives or stand on ideas which are contained in in you know the Hebrew Bible, as compared to the volunteers in the study who may have been convinced of the truth of certain things they believed before but weren't quite sure, mm -hmm. or um, you know they received some you know, personal healing. Let's say, you know they were quite you know limited in scope. You know so obviously. I mean, either, you know, the information in the two states is very different or the ability of the person having the experience to extract information from uh, that state or those states is quite different. Uh, you know, so I began to look at, well, you know, what is the message of the Hebrew Bible? Um, and you know, that, I think, is the soul of prophecy. Uh, if you look at the Hebrew Bible as a you know, prophetic you know, text, one that was received and collated and transmitted uh, under the uh, under the umbrella of you know, the prophetic state, you know, then the whole you know, text is a you know, prophetic text. Um, and uh, oh God, where was I taking this? Hmm. <laughs> Take your yeah, time. Yeah, you know so. Uh, oh, yes, uh, the soul of prophecy is, is the information 
uh, which is received and communicated uh, you know, from that state. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, so that's the information that uh, is you know, transmitted by the prophets as compared to you know, transmitted by the volunteers. And it's a you know, fairly simple message. It's got you know, two parts. You know, one has to do you know, with belief and you know, the other has to do with action. You know, the belief is of one God, which you know, precludes idolatry or paganism or, or uh, of idol worship. Okay. And you know, the behavioral you know, the, you know, the behavioral, uh, you know, statement, I guess, is, you know, the golden rule, you know, uh, the, the golden rule, uh, you know, uh, to love your, uh, in, um, uh, you know, to love your fellow as yourself. Right, right. The, I think my grandfather said it was do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a pretty common way, I think. No, no, that's not the golden rule. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, yeah. Well, you know, doing unto others as you want unto you. I mean, that's really narcissistic. I see. I see. I see. The result you result oriented. Love, love others. Yeah, it isn't love that yourself. spirit. It's a zero. It's a you know zero sum, uh, you know recontextualization of the golden rule. I you see, know, the yeah. golden rule, as stated in Leviticus, is uh you know, love your fellow as yourself, you know, love your fellow as much as you love yourself, yeah. which is a lot more sophisticated and, you know, doesn't have to do with any self-serving you know, uh, okay. Okay. You know, purposes. I'm going to reframe that entire conversation that I remember with my grandfather so that it, it fits that golden rule more appropriately. And I, uh, I, I appreciate the reframe because it, that to me that just that elevates consciousness so much more to to incorporate love and self love and others uh it's a much more expansive perspective on that idea exactly beautiful it's a spiritual one it's it's a spiritual one it isn't a uh, you know, psychological one right yeah i can't say that he was a uh, a spiritual person uh, or a religious person um, because I think he had some difficulty moving through grief that he experienced with his mother dying when he was very young. So, uh, yeah, some people some people cope with it in different ways, and I, I suppose that that might have been how he did that, the do unto others sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you do things for any number of reasons. Uh, you know, one is you know, to avoid pain, you know, and to uh, obtain pleasure. Uh, so, you know, th that more you know, primitive, but still it's an effective, uh, you know, motto, I guess, or, you know, saying. Uh, it's self-protective, it helps other people. Yeah, you know, but it is, it's, you know, more of a you know, psychological or you know, sociological take as opposed to, uh, uh, more elevated one, like, you know, self-love, you know, like you're talking about, it's, it's key. Like if you love yourself, you know what it's like to love, you know how it feels to be loved. Um, yeah, you know, so you've got that available to you that you may not otherwise have, which you can then, you know, share, uh, if you're so inclined. Beautiful, beautiful. Well said. And, uh, I love how you, you made it seem like we have choice and and i think throughout the the biblical scriptures there's a there's a big component of choice offered well it's just this historical you know linear you know narrative of the uh you know choices made by mankind since creation uh every effect has got preceding causes and uh yeah it's quite uh it's quite a timeline um yeah, you know, so it's assumed that people are able to choose, uh, and the you know, text is a record of what happens with those choices, what those choices are. Um, yeah, you know, you know, these are you know theological ideas, uh, which the you know psychological or which the you know, psychedelic community as a whole 
I don't think has taken a very sophisticated approach to <laughs> no. um, right you know right now it's you know, kind of a hodgepodge of you know new age shamanism evangelical christianity um mm. yeah it isn't especially you know well articulated um and i think you know that's one of the boons of a text and a you know, tradition like the hebrew bible is that it you know, deals with experiences which share many features with the psychedelic state but at the same time it's not the experiences which are important but the information which they receive in those experiences and communicate you know to the larger community you know so i think uh, as a you know, framework which incorporates the idea of one god and the golden rule uh, you know those are you know concepts which are really uh, you know, shown a spotlight upon uh, to understand um, in the text and the, and in uh, the writings. Um, you know, so if you know somebody is you know, looking for a spiritual scaffolding uh, within which to or upon which to um, stand when you're, you know, tripping. Let's say the there are okay. e examples in the text of people in prophetic states asking angels and God to clarify, to explain, to argue with, um, you know, so those kinds of narratives can provide some, you know, guidance. If you're, let's say, you know, tripping on ayahuasca and you encounter a being, what do you ask it? And, uh, and you know, how do you ask it? Um, and, uh, you know, how do you know it's telling you the truth? And you know, how do you remember it and you know, communicate it? Uh, and if you need help understanding it, you know, what do you do? Uh, you know, so all that is spelled out in the text, and you know, the prophetic text, like Abraham has questions, where he's got a request, or uh, yeah, it's just you know, kind of uh, you know laid down in very uh, you know, practical terms that you can learn from, I think, and then you know take into the psychedelic state. Beautiful. And I think most of your books, uh, the layout, at least the DMT series books, um, uh, The Spirit Molecule and The Soul of Prophecy, these, these tend to be a little bit more uh, instruction manuals and uh, like journalistic books versus, uh, versus like novels. Um, and they're really easy to read. So if, if our listeners are, are looking to pick up a book for the holidays i i highly recommend this hanukkah is coming up i gave one as a hanukkah gift to a friend <laughs> what do your jewish friends think of this idea you well, theo neurology you know god's overflowing and in, into our brains and you know, dmt uh, and then you know, visions um so i have let's see i have like five jewish friends here in san diego and i can think of at least two of them that I haven't discussed this with and two, three of them that I, I definitely know are on, they're able to follow this conversation and, and give nods to it. So they're, they're more on the side of um, psychedelics are um, maybe a part of something that people have done for thousands of years. Um, psychedelic and theogen and theogenic experience, you know, DMT prophetic experience. So I, I think, and, and at least one of those people was from Israel, was born and raised in Israel. Mm -hmm. So I, oh, I'm good. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. I'm excited to hear an opinion of somebody who I gave this book to as a gift um, because he had actually for a period of time been a, been a Hasidic, um, Hasidic Orthodox. Uh, he'd been an Orthodox Hasidic. Jewish person um, practicing with you know that whole uh, aspect of the of the, is it the law we call it the law. Uh, well, rabbinic Judaism requires adherence to certain precepts that regulate your daily life. Yeah, so he was he was just doing orthodoxy for a bit, and now he's not. And I know him through men's group, so we do a lot of. Uh, communication in the Marshall Rosenberg style with nonviolent communication and compassionate listening. And then, uh, 
the other friend of mine, the other couple of friends of mine, I think one is more like, oh, gosh, I, I, have a, I have trouble describing where she's at, but I want to say that she's more like uh, Jewish upbringing and mm, like almost pagan, almost pagan. But that that might you know I might not have really dived in with her d d dove in and, and asked her like where her belief system lies. I know she practices things like ayahuasca and takes ayahuasca. Um, and then oh, on this show actually twice this year we've had a a, a shamanic practitioner um, named Itzak Biri who's also published under the same publisher as as you are with this uh, DMT Soul of Pro Prophecy, and he was raised in. Um, one of those Jewish com communities, I forget that, they're like rural communities. In a kibbutz. Kibbutz, yeah. Yeah. So he's, I, I think he's a really kind soul and he has a lot of compassion and he practices his shamanic um, rituals with that in mind. Um, but I don't know how, how deeply involved with modern uh, Jewish mysticism he is. I know he lives in New York and he travels around the world uh, and he t often takes people to Peru and, and Bolivia and, and Brazil and stuff. Yeah, you know, there's uh, you know, somebody that comes to the States occasionally who's a Hasidic Jew uh, and uh, leads ayahuasca ceremonies. Interesting. Very interesting. I mean, medicine for the people is medicine, and and when it comes to uh, communication with the all that is, the great spirit, um, in this case, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, I think let's let's do it. Let's talk. Let's let's figure this out, and maybe that'll arise, uh, help us to arrive in a place that is more appropriate uh, as moderns. Yeah, and um, you know. The question always comes up about, you know, did the Hebrews trip or did Ezekiel take a mushroom or was, you know, Moses uh, sleep deprived? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think you need to, you know, locate an exogenous you know, source of, uh, say, DMT uh, because it's, you know, made in, you know, the mammalian brain. Uh, it's conceivable that, you know, levels could get to a point. Uh, on their own, uh, without outside stimulation from a plant or a, a fungus, um, to change consciousness in a prophetic kind of way. Um, you know, the stumble. Well, you know, there's a number of stumbling blocks people come up with against the prophetic model that I'm uh, talking about. You know, one is you know, that uh, the you know, source of information exists outside of yourself, you know, that God and you are different. Uh, and even though you can come close, you can't really become one with or uh, become, you know, God. Uh, but, you know, but you can, you know, communicate, you know, just like we're communicating. You're there, I'm here, and, you know, we're talking. Uh, you know, so, you know, that's a stumbling you know, block for some people who believe it's all within, it's all within, it's all a you know, projection, it's a mirror. Mm. I don't think that's the case with, uh, you know, the traditional prophetic uh, stream. You know, the other um, is the uh, question of the content of the prophetic uh, stream, you know, the, you know, the history, as it were, that's being you know, laid out uh, in the text. And it's a, it's about the people Israel beginning with it well you know beginning with Adam obviously but becoming more specifically you know focused on Abraham as the first of the Hebrews the first of the Jews you know so you know what is you know because you know what is you know, the history well if 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 there's one thing that's also emphasized in the text is you know God's involvement with history uh, you know the tower of uh, you know, well, the Tower of you know, Babel, uh, the splitting of the Red Sea, uh, the you know, revelation on top of you know, Mount Sinai, you know, all of you know, those are you know, narratives of you know, God's intervening in history. In other words, you know, God is steering history in a particular direction. And uh, 
you know, then that gets particular and gets specific and, you know, raises the whole issue of, uh, you know, the role of the Hebrews, of the Jews in, or, you know, in, in the world. Um, and, you know, that becomes contentious. <laughs> uh, so I, I think, you know, that's another you know, reason that you know, the prophetic model uh, it may, you know, remain you know, somewhat you know, peripheral for a while, at least, you know, taken seriously. Yes. So uh, maybe we can speak directly, um, make commentary around some of the things that are touched on in this book and that maybe you've touched on in previous interviews. And I know that I've actually uh, been seen and maybe you've been recorded around town. Uh, I, 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 I want to say like evangelizing, <laughs> But uh, it's it's like the scene in the Hebrew Bible when we're up on Mount Sinai and Moses is converging on the burning bush and he has a vision and there's a there's a whole dialogue that occurs there in 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 some some uh, in theogenic circles it's believed that he's he's tripping on whatever's burning there. Um. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's an Israeli psychologist, you know, uh, you know Benny Shannon, um, who you know, published a paper some years back on the you know, burning bush, you know, being a kind of acacia, and many of the acacias contain DMT. You know, so the theory goes that the burning bush, you know, Moses, you know, was was, you know, um, was inhaling you know, vaporized DMT. But you know, even if you know that were true, uh, there isn't any other evidence for any of the other people undergoing uh, you know, prophecy of uh, a burning bush or smoking tryptamines. Um, you know, there's cannabis, which you know, some um, are proposing is an ingredient in the incense that was burned in the Holy of Holies once a year, uh, in which case the high priest could communicate with God. But you know, you know, that's one you know, limited uh, example too occurs one time a year in one person. Um, you know, there's you know the manna, which you know Dan Merker you know proposed was a kind of ergot you know, fungus. Uh, but if you look at the level of you know, prophecy of the whole Hebrew people in the desert, it was you know, pretty low level um, as compared you know, to the prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and uh, Jeremiah. And, you know, there isn't any evidence, you know, that the canonical prophets um, who experienced full-blown, you know, highly articulate, you know, well-characterized, uh, you know, uh, uh, experiences of, you know, the prophetic state, you know, there's no evidence of, you know, them eating manna or any other outside substance. So there's a scene, and, and I, I really appreciate you offering clarity on that and the, and the whole manna thing. There's a scene that I think pre predates the the the, the in the timeline of of the uh, Moses and the Jews leaving Egypt, in which they they supposedly are um, you know servants and they're commanded to eat unleavened bread and and what if uh, I okay going back to in theogenic circles what if in within those in theogenic circles that I run in um, that bread had ergotaloid fungus in it and um it was served or not the unleavened bread but the the other bread that was served to the rest of the egyptians at the time maybe they were maybe the other egyptians including pharaoh were tripping and and it was rather easy for their for there to be an exodus uh well you know that is possible uh yeah i mean that's possible the you know fact is you know for whatever reason you know Moses was able you know to lead all of these you know people out to the desert for the next you know forty years. Um, you know the mechanisms are cool. Yeah, I mean endless you know gallons of ink have been spilled and will be spilled about the mechanisms. You know, was it this drug or that drug? Was it this plant or that plant? Uh, but it's the states that lead to information uh, that I think is, you know, the highlight uh, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, approach to altered states that is more pragmatic. Like, what do you do with tripping? You know, 
you know, what's in there that you can use both in your thinking and your behavior. You know, so the states and what the you know, chemicals are, you know, those are kind of relevant, but uh, what's important and endures and uh, influenced is, uh, is the information. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. I, I, I'm, hmm. I'm wondering if you're willing to talk about your uh, novel, which was, uh, I think its title is Levi something. I, because that, that might be a fun way to sort of end our, our I'm going to say mm -hmm. seasonal holiday special. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Joseph Levy Escapes Death. Uh, it's a autobiographical novel that came out in March. It's uh, the account of an alter ego of mine, Joseph Levy. Joseph, uh, okay. You know, to you know, forestall uh, many you know, premature conclusions, uh, you know, I am a nicer guy than Joseph Levy. But, you know, <laughs> Joseph Levy spends a year being you know, sick and recuperating in a small southwest town with limited you know, medical proficiency. Uh, and uh, he's in a bad mood most of the time, but uh, there are flashes of hope uh, and uh, some wonderful people who pass through. Some real nutballs too, so uh, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, well, it's, it, it's, I think, you know, falls into a number of, you know, different categories. You, you know, medical humor, you know, self-help. Um, I, you know, throw in the uh, Christian, you know, basis of anti-Semitism in there. You know, so it's, you know, it's, you know, kind of wide-ranging. Um, yeah, you know, my two inspirations or my two, uh, you know, role models uh, for, you know, writing fiction or that kind of fiction uh, are Bukowski and, you know, P.K. Dick. You know, Charles Bukowski and you know, Philip Dick. Yeah. You know, they can describe you know, very strange scenes and uh, just you know, keep their wits about them. You know, Dick is really good at introspection and free association and internal dialogue. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of internal you know, monologue, I guess, uh, in the Joseph Levy book. Um, yeah, it's short, 220 pages, I think. Uh, it's a small book, uh, you know, five by seven, I think. Yeah, you know, so uh, it's a quick read. Friends read it in, you know, six hours. Uh, or, you know, anybody can read it in you know, six hours. But uh, uh, it's been getting good reviews and good blurbs. Um, it's kind of hard, you know, breaking into a completely different genre. I mean, right. it's been hard enough from the psychedelic, you know, to the religious. <laughs> but from, you know, nonfiction to, you know, fiction. Uh, is even tougher. Yeah, I mean, you're you're like a man of of so many different mantles, and most of them have been, uh, you know, very nuanced, very rebellious, in some ways quite maverick. And uh, I I look forward to reading this um, Joseph Levy book. It's an autobiography, he said. Well, it's was referred to as autobiographical fiction. Oh, fun. Okay, this could be really fun. I mean, it'll help me to clue in because because I've been following you a number of years. It'll help me to clue in as to uh, who sits before me and and what has become of all the experiences that led to this to this moment. Yeah, um, you know, one of the common refrains of the book, or from you know, people that have you know, read the book, is that the character lacks redemption. He's never redeemed, and he may be irredeemable. Uh oh, and uh, I think you know that's an interesting observation, and it assumes a certain thing about you know fiction, and as a, a corollary about uh, you know real life, is you know that there ought to be you know some redemption you know through suffering. Um, but I mean, who says? Uh, I think it's as good as it gets sometimes to just observe and uh, you know deal and then you know, tell a story and you know, then go on uh, so the whole idea of well it's not a re you know the you know the character is not redeemed he's not like more holy or working with the poor or starting an orphanage uh, 
yeah, he just scrapes by, starts with a bad tooth, ends with a bad tooth, uh, or, or a replacement for the second bad tooth. Um, yeah, you know, so it's just kind of gritty, you know, kind of weird, uh, you know, small town, Southwest, uh, uh, you know, lots of natives. Yeah, you know, so it was, uh, well, you know, it, it corresponds to a year of my poor health and recuperation. Uh, so uh, I got a lot of my PTSD worked out in the writing. Very, very nice. Oh, that brings me full circle to something we did table. The near-death experience. And uh, I, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. And you're welcome to free associate. I, I totally, when I first got your, your original book, DMT and uh, The Spirit Molecule, I, I went on a, a yoga teaching, like almost preacher, pre preacherly lecture series where I talked about all the different techniques in, with that I knew within yoga, specifically pranayam, that would help us with uh, preparation for death and dying. And you were this huge inspiration to me, and I love that word, inspiration, because of your willingness to to put that out there as as a, as a connection to DMT, the the idea that uh, near death could be um, a place where we get more DMT experiences. Um, yeah, well, we're kind of winding down, so maybe we could go into, you know, more detail maybe next time. Uh, but yeah, you know, to the extent, well, you know, my you know, favorite mantra when you know, people say, well, is DMT involved in this or that? Uh, you know, my stock answer is, you know, to the extent that the non-drug state resembles that brought on by giving DMT, it makes you know, sense that there's some uh, you know, common biology. Very, very nice. All right. So I, I can imagine that we could do a, a future show in which we get to fully investigate the near death state and maybe I'll even get to read in your, your novel. Well, you know, that was interesting. Uh, you know, like I was close to dying at a certain point, I was going into shock uh, or, you know, you know, my character was, and, uh, you know, I was expecting it, or the character was expecting it to be like a DMT experience, but instead, it was like the volume was being turned down, and yeah. the you know, dimmer switch was being turned down. <laughs> uh, there weren't any fireworks or anything at all. Uh -oh. um, so that was a bit, uh, but but still, uh, it wasn't uh, NDE. I mean, I was going into shock, you know, but I hadn't flatlined or uh, stopped breathing or my heart stopped or anything. Uh, but at least, you know, the prelude was you know, pretty ordinary. Uh, yes, I would agree. I've, I've had the, uh, the shock state and I haven't had, well, I, I guess I have had an NDE, but I was very young. So this is really fun. Um, this has been Dr. Rick Strassman, and we've been discussing DMT and the soul of prophecy. If people wanted to reach out to you, you know, I, I did one when I was uh, waiting for you to jump on the line here, I did a little bit of research on the Cottonwood Research Foundation. Are you still a part of that? Yeah, yeah, but it's kind of hibernating right now. Right. Um, you know, we were the fiscal sponsor for the DMT movie, right. or a fiscal sponsor. Very um, nice. And, uh, but you know, there's all this good research going on uh, that uh, I think our vision, although still hasn't been actualized uh it's getting there uh you know there's more research there's more acceptance there's more mainstreaming there's more education you know so um i'm pretty busy and the other two guys are pretty busy so uh it's on hold for now we're maintaining our non-profit you know tax deductible status that's pretty easy at this point uh but it's just you know waiting for i don't know an influx of a um, lot of money or some mm -hmm. kind of uh inspiration beautiful uh tell people how they can reach out to you what we can expect from you if you've got anything on the bill for 2020 that you're appearing um as a speaker for or that you're writing well uh, let's see well if people want to reach me and to you know, buy a book you know from me you can go to my website rickstrossman.com and i have a, a facebook page you can follow me there um 
what am I doing in 2020? Well, I've got a couple of more uh, you know, writing projects. Nice. Uh, you know, perhaps some more installments in the Joseph Levy you know, saga. Uh, mm. And I've been studying the character of Abraham in the Bible quite a lot uh, for a number of years. And I'd like to try my hand at some biblical fiction, uh, the life and times of Abraham. Uh, nice. You know, so I might be going to Europe in the summer. Uh, and um, there's a, at least one conference. Um, yeah, I don't like to travel uh, that much alone, and I'm alone right now. So uh, I you know, generally don't uh, attend conferences and whatnot, but uh, I may be in Europe uh, in June. Okay, very good. And I, I want to implore our listeners to check out rickstrassman.com. I think that's originally how we had an email conversation over 10 years ago. And uh, you did write me back. And I really appreciate you being down to earth like that. Uh, sure. Uh, well, it's a responsibility besides being you know, mostly you know, fun to, you know, to, you know, to answer every email. <laughs> um, I mean, if you know, people make the effort, if, you know, if you know, people have questions, uh, yeah, it, it isn't a small thing you know, to write a guy who's written about you know, DMT. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's you know, the least I could do. Absolutely. Pick up a copy of DMT, The Soul, and The Soul of Prophecy uh, with Park Street Press and Inner Traditions. You can find them on innertraditions.com and their catalog and thereof. This has been an edition of in theo radio our uh i want to call this our hanukkah special are you are you gonna celebrate hanukkah this year? <laughs> uh that's fine all I right object. all right this is our hanukkah special i'll, I'll light a menorah i think in, in a couple weeks right on the 22nd uh let's see first night is the 22nd sunday all right i'll light a, a menorah and i'll think of us and uh, all the wonderful things that the ancient peoples have been through and the visions thereof. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Trevor. <laughs> have, a, have a good one. And you can listen to Entheo Radio across all the podcast medias, including iTunes now, and find us on Facebook. Uh, Entheo Radio is spelled E-N-T-H-E-O Radio.